Lord be with you. And also with you. Children of God, welcome to worship. Today, as we gather for worship, we continue walking in faith. One of the many ways that we are walking in faith together is by walking with smaller groups of members of the church. If you are interested in a small group and want to get together uh, virtually or in a socially distant way with some people, please let us know so that we can help put you together with people in ways that you can study the Bible, talk about the struggles of life and the journey that you're on, and also find support in that journey. I hope that you will reach out to me. You can do that by emailing me at adam at stgilespres.org and tell me um, a little bit about your schedule and I'll help try and find a small group that you can be a part of that will meet your needs and your schedule but also give you support as we walk in faith together. We want to give thanks for those artists who are bringing us images of what it is to walk in faith. Um, so we're grateful for the time and energy they put in and um, can share that they will be adding more in the coming weeks. So watch for how the sanctuary changes. It is possible that we will have more people joining us for worship in the coming weeks here in the sanctuary. So whether you come to church to visit the office during the week, if you're coming to help with the YMCA program here, if you're participating in a small group or any activity, please make sure that you're being safe and considerate of those around you. Wear a mask, wash your hands, make sure that everyone is doing their best to take care of everyone else from the weakest of these to the greatest. Now let us prepare our hearts and minds to worship God. Our help is in the name of the Lord. Who called on a mother to float her child down river. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice as we live sacrificially and are transformed by God. Come, let us walk with God as we continue worship singing hymn 817. We walk by faith and not by sight. We walk by faith and not by sight with gracious words drawn near. Oh, Christ who spoke as none spoke, my peace be See 
So every week in worship, we have a prayer of confession. And this prayer of confession is a recognition that we are not perfect like God. It's a recognition that actually we are imperfect. We are broken and needing God. We're hurting from this need. And um, so we turn to this prayer of confession with humility, with open hands, lifted up, ready to receive God's grace. And we also pray this prayer with great faith, knowing that Christ has already forgiven us before we asked. So then let us pray together. We confess that the call to be living sacrifices sounds painful and unattractive. We are more comfortable avoiding the difficult experiences of life that lead to transformation and growth It's easier to be silent than it is to speak up in the face of injustice. It's easier to accept the way things are rather than work for policy changes. It's easier to binge on screen time and be distracted by apps on our devices than it is to dedicate time in meditation or study of your word. Push and convict us, O Lord. Help us to choose the more difficult path. Bless us with the strength to endure the suffering of living as a sacrifice in order to walk with you into the source of life that never ends. Source of all mercy, forgive us. The struggles of life bless us with transformation when our eyes are on God. Sisters and brothers, open your eyes and see the world made new. Let all who have ears hear the words of Christ. You are forgiven. Let all who have breath breathe in the new life that is all around. As God's forgiven children, let us live. The peace of Christ be with you. Please join with me the prayer for illumination. Light of the world, brighten our hearts to hear with inspiration and respond with courage to your word. Our first scripture passage this morning is from the book of Exodus, chapter one, verse eight, through chapter two, verse 10. Now a new king came to power in Egypt who didn't know Joseph. He said to his people, the Israelite people are now larger in number and stronger than we are. Come on, let's be smart and deal with them. Otherwise, they will only grow in number. And if war breaks out, they will join our enemies, fight against us, and then escape from the land. As a result, the Egyptians put foremen of forced work gangs over the Israelites to harass them with hard work. They had to build storage cities named Pithom and Ramesses for Pharaoh. But the more they were oppressed, the more they grew and spread, so much so that the Egyptians started to look at the Israelites with disgust and dread. So the Egyptians enslaved the Israelites. They made their lives miserable with hard work, making mortar and bricks doing field work, and by forcing them to do all kinds of other cruel work. The king of Egypt spoke to two Hebrew midwives named Sifra and Puah. When you are helping the Hebrew women give birth and you see the baby being born, if it's a boy, kill him. But if it's a girl, you can let her live. Now the two midwives respected God so they didn't obey the Egyptian king's order. Instead, they let the baby boys live. So the king of Egypt called the two midwives and said to them, why are you doing this? Why are you letting the baby boys live? 
the two midwives said to Pharaoh, because Hebrew women aren't like Egyptian women. They are much stronger and give birth before any midwives can get to them. So God treated the midwives well, and the people kept on multiplying and became very strong. And because the midwives respected God, God gave them households of their own. Then Pharaoh gave an order to all his people, throw every baby boy born to the Hebrews into the Nile River, but you can let all the girls live. Now a man from Levi's household married a Levite woman. The woman became pregnant and gave birth to a son. She saw that the baby was healthy and beautiful, so she hid him for three months. When she couldn't hide him any longer, she took a reed basket and sealed it up with black tar. She put the child in the basket and set the basket among the reeds at the riverbank. The baby's older sister stood watch nearby to see what would happen to him. Pharaoh's daughter came down to bathe in the river while her servants walked along beside the river. She saw the basket among the reeds and she sent one of her servants to bring it to her. When she opened it, she saw the child. The boy was crying and she felt sorry for him. She said, this must be one of the Hebrews' children. Then the baby's sister said to Pharaoh's daughter, would you like me to go and find one of the Hebrew women to nurse the child for you? Pharaoh's daughter agreed, yes, do that. So the girl went and called the child's mother. Pharaoh's daughter said to her, take this child and nurse it for me, and I'll pay you for your work. So the woman took the child and nursed it. After the child had grown up, she brought him back to Pharaoh's daughter, who adopted him as her son. She named him Moses because, she said, I pulled him out of the water. Good morning. Ajahn. Good morning. So this morning, um, uh, we're going to tell a story about the cross. Look behind you. We're sitting in church right now in the big sanctuary. And what's up there on the wall? The cross. And what does the cross remind you of? Does it remind you of somebody? No. Okay. It, we know that at Easter, Jesus died on the cross. And then three days later... Jesus was resurrected. He came back to life. We know that when somebody dies, how does that make you feel? Sad. sad. Very sad. It makes you feel very sad. And so when we look at the cross, even though it is good news for us and makes us happy, sometimes we need to remember that it was sad when Jesus died. And that should make us sad to remember that Jesus hurt. He was hurt by others. And the reason Jesus went to the cross was because he was sad for us and wanted to help us. So let's say a prayer before we finish this morning. So put your hands together and repeat after me. Dear God, thank you for loving me. Thank you for loving me. Help me. Help me. To remember. To remember. People who are sad. People who are sad. And to take care of others. Take care of others. And love others. To love others. As you ask. As you ask. Amen. Have a great day. Today we continue to walk in faith by walking to the cross. The result is today will likely feel a bit paradoxical because the cross is the greatest instrument of public torture and also the greatest tool of redemption. So feel that tension. Hear the invitation today to walk into this journey to be uncomfortable. That will and should happen because if we are to do as Paul will ask and present our bodies as living sacrifices, we must be willing to walk into that suffering. 
to make the choices that God is choosing to be with the oppressed, the downtrodden, the marginalized, those who have the least power, and walk with them because they are part of the body of Christ, and that they are also the greatest. So make an intentional choice. Choose to be uncomfortable. Choose to feel the emotions that may arise. Feelings of guilt, shame, anger, defensiveness, denial, justification, sadness, disgust, all of those might be normal, albeit unhelpful reactions, to hearing difficult truths. And when those feelings arise, I invite you to pause, to breathe, to opt in again. Continue to choose to walk in faith with God toward the cross. Pause, breathe. Pause and breathe. The Spirit of God is the breath of life. And so when we pause, we breathe in the Spirit of God. When life seems overwhelming, we breathe in God's Spirit. Imagine how many arguments you might have avoided, how many wars or battles or lives might have been saved if we had paused instead of responding instantly with vitriol, with anger. Continue to choose to listen, to ask the Spirit to be with you in the pain of the response to be faithful in suffering and sacrifice as you opt in and hear these words from Paul that invite us to be living sacrifices. For Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And we know that in Jesus, if Jesus is the word, that in seeking truth, we are seeking God. So let us walk towards the cross today. Paul wrote to the church in Rome in that 12th chapter of Romans with these words. So, brothers and sisters, because of God's mercies, I encourage you to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, one that is holy and pleasing to God. This is your appropriate priestly service. Don't be conformed to the patterns of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your minds so that you can figure out what God's will is, what is good, what is pleasing, what is mature. Because of the grace that God gave me, I can say to each one of you, don't think of yourself more highly than you ought to. Instead, be reasonable. Be reasonable since God has measured out a portion of faith to each one of you. We have many parts, many members, and we are one body. Not all the parts have the same function. In the same way, though there are many of us, we are one body in Christ. Individually, we belong to each other. We belong to each other. We have different gifts that cons are consistent with God's grace that has been given to us. If yours is the gift of prophecy, then you should prophesy in proportion to your faith. If yours is the gift of service, then devote yourself to serving. If yours is the gift of teaching, devote yourself to teaching. If yours the gift of encouragement, devote yourself to encouraging. The one giving should do it with no strings attached. And the leader should lead with passion. The one showing mercy should always be cheerful in showing that mercy. Holy wisdom, holy word. Friends, I have a beautiful cross that dangles from my neck. Every service I preach, I get to wear this beautiful cross. And as I preach today, I stand underneath a sign that says, Walk in Faith, which is also underneath a cross that is above and is one that you have seen many times in this sanctuary. That cross is empty, and my cross on my neck is also empty. It is embellished and beautiful, and it is a sign that there is no more violence on these crosses. Gone from both are the symbols of torture that marked the original crucifixion. The suffering Christ has been removed so that our focus is now on an empty cross. And in every preaching class, 
I had the delight to be in, I was told, you got to end with the gospel. People are coming to church for good news. We are here to tell stories of resurrection, not stories of suffering, sacrifice, or torture, or death. And while that may have been human wisdom and may have been what I was taught in seminary, I tell you that the cross is empty and meaningless if it is not both an instrument of torture and an instrument of life. There is something weird, mysterious, painful, profound about using the cross as a symbol for faith. We cannot tell stories of an empty cross without emptying the cross of power. There will be consistent tension and paradox in this sermon. Because as we talk about this symbol, we are talking about it as the symbol of the greatest terror and the greatest joy. Bejeweled crosses that glitter and shine don't carry the gritty reality of the cross which Jesus was crucified on. They might speak of the resurrection and the glory and abundance of God that is coming, but they do not speak of the suffering of the oppressed peoples who walk day in and day out in reality to get to those kingdoms of glory. When the blood is no longer staining the wood of death's instrument, it's easy for us to settle for cheap grace and to forget the cost of discipleship. When suffering is removed from our story of faith, it's easy to lose lose sight of the suffering that is present in the world all around. Empty crosses don't show us how God stands with the oppressed because God was one of the oppressed. Christ hangs as the strange fruit of the lynching tree. Here, God is both murdered and reborn. Love sacrifices all in the face of evil. Love demands that we look at death and torture straight in the face. And if we are to walk with God, we must walk with our sisters and our brothers to the cross. The walk of faith is costly. It is a life of sacrifice. sacrifice. To walk with God is is to destroy the tools of the oppressor by being destroyed by the tools of the oppressor. Such walking is a constant refusal to give up, and it is to sing hymns that proclaim trouble don't last always, and to know that joy comes with the morning. Now, I am fully aware that there are many differences between myself and God. One of those striking differences is that I seem to have an innate ability to choose not to suffer, where God chose suffering. I find myself like Peter, who when I hear about paths that are difficult and suffering, say, ah, maybe there's another way. And in those moments, I hear Christ proclaiming, get behind me. Get behind me, Satan. You are thinking human thoughts. You're not thinking godly thoughts. I think that is one of the reasons why Paul is pleading for the church in Rome to present their bodies as, little, as living sacrifices. It is a call for us to continually choose to walk again with Jesus towards the cross, to opt in, to look, and never to walk away. I say this because for me, as a middle-class, cisgender, straight, white, married male with two children and a mortgage in America, I am automatically blessed and given certain unalienable rights that others have to fight for day in and day out. I rarely have to justify or explain my existence. People don't follow me around stores if I put my hands in my pockets because they think I have shoplifted. My gender, my race, my being gives me privileges because the world that I occupy has been founded on principles of white supremacy and issues of power that I did not endorse but benefit from. 
and it is hard to hear or admit or talk about these truths. But when we look at statistics that show pay gaps between men and women, differences, stark differences in incarceration rates between black and white citizens of this country, when we talk about equity and equality, the list of white privileges can go on and on and on. I don't have time to unpack all of them here, but I do want to have deeper conversations about those things, where we can understand what it is to sacrifice and to work for greater equality. For me and for all other privileged people, the challenge is to embrace the call in front of us and present our lives as living sacrifices. Sometimes for equality to happen, scales have to be rebalanced. If we are privileged, we have to give so that others have similar privileges. But here's the tricky thing. The tricky thing about privilege is that it isn't earned, and it often feels normal when you have it. I didn't know that I was a beneficiary of many of these systems until other people called me out on them. I didn't know because I was ignorant, because my world just affirmed me for being who I was. If I spoke up in a meeting, I wasn't called bossy. I was called assertive. I was encouraged to ask questions, and those questions weren't seen as threats. I was encouraged to fail and to make mistakes, and that those weren't terminal objects because they were just experiences. But I know that not everybody has those benefits. I know this because I don't have to justify my existence. My lived reality does not include a fear that I'm going to get pulled over while driving to church simply because of my race. I don't have to worry about which bathroom I should use because my gender identity is consistent with the one that was assigned to me on my birth certificate. For me and all privileged people, our challenge is to embrace the call to present ourselves as living sacrifices. And it is tricky. Consider again and hear again the story from Exodus. This is a story about oppressed people finding a deliverer. But I found that as I read it, I didn't really relate all that much to the Hebrews. Instead, I thought, it was easier to relate to the Pharaoh, the king. Because the Pharaoh had tremendous power and privilege. The Pharaoh was born into power and taught from his birth that the gods ordained the world to be that way. That he had the position he had because that was what things were supposed to be like. The society was unequal, but it wasn't unfair because the perspective of the slaves wasn't one that was a voice at the table. Egyptians were on the top, the Hebrews and the other slaves were on the bottom of that societal ladder. And it probably felt right. It probably felt justified to the Egyptian people and certainly to the Pharaoh. The Pharaoh knows that in order to maintain that power, he's going to have to prevent the uprisings from happening. If the people were to take to the streets and start marching in protests, if they got a voice that proclaimed that they too were humans and not just hands or work, the world might change in ways that would upset the system. The Pharaoh knows that boys can grow up into men and men can become warriors and warriors can in great enough numbers overthrow kingdoms. And so the classic story of patriarchy is told again and again. And instead of using his privilege as the pharaoh, his power as the leader of this community to work with all the people, he chooses to use his power over people. The Egyptians are not heeding the call to live as sacrifices. They are not working towards equality. And we will see in the story of Exodus that God does not side with the Pharaoh because God never sides with the oppressors. Instead, God will bring a deliverer, 
one who is thrown into the violent, frothing Nile River, a child who was sacrificed. God will stand with a mother on the side of the shores of the Nile, weeping as she weeps, crying out in pain to be heard in the night, wrapping her baby one last time before kissing it goodbye and thinking she will never see that child again. Her story is the story that needs to be told, and it is a story that unless we pause to listen, to hear stories of families and oppressed people who continue to struggle to this day, go unnoticed. The basket that will deliver Moses to Pharaoh's daughter is another symbol of violence and torture yet another symbol that God will use for deliverance and redemption. Because we are removed from this story, it's easy to see the Pharaoh and the Egyptians as the oppressors and the wrongdoers. But because we are not so far removed from our own stories, it is difficult to see ourselves as oppressors. It is our challenge and our call and our privilege to walk with God towards the cross. When we walk with the oppressed, we do God's work. And we always have the option of walking away. But the call is to walk towards, to turn our gaze into the eyes of those who are suffering, to amplify their stories, to hear their needs, not to deny realities. It is to walk into the streets to proclaim that black lives matter when black lives are threatened. Because such a proclamation does not mean that only black lives matter, but that all lives matter to God. And that because all lives matter, when black lives are threatened, we say black lives matter. God walks with the oppressed. God stands with the suffering. God marches to that cross and we are called to do likewise. Hear the words of the Spirit as she speaks through Paul. Hear her words and choose and wonder, how am I being called to walk with Christ to the cross in this time and this place? So brothers and sisters, because of God's mercies, I encourage you to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, one that is holy and pleasing to God. This is your appropriate priestly service. Do not be conformed to the patterns and powers and privileges of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your minds so that you can figure out what God's will is, so that you can figure out what is good and pleasing and mature. Because of the grace that God gave me, I can say to each one of you, don't think of yourself more highly than you ought to. Instead, be reasonable, since God has measured out a portion of faith to each and every one of us. Sisters and brothers, how are you called to present your body as a living sacrifice? How will you walk in faith with God? Having heard the word of God read and proclaimed, let us together state what we believe using words from the book of Romans in the eighth chapter. We believe there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, for we know that all things work together for good for those who love God, who are called according to God's purpose. We are convinced that neither death nor life nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. We bring to worship our joys as well as our concerns, and um, this week we are particularly glad to welcome to life John Martin Hunter. 
um, whose parents are Marshall and Caitlin. His brother is William, and he has grandparents in this church too. So we are so grateful that he's come to our church family, and we celebrate the gift of life. Thanks be to God. We're also mindful of other babies that are coming soon to our congregation. So please join me in praying for their families. I know that all of us are praying for those starting school this week. For parents sending their children to school, whether that is at home or actually in the school building, we pray for those parents who are sending their students here to our church for the YMCA's remote e-learning site. We pray for all of our teachers who have gone back to work. We pray for your patience, for your wisdom, for your compassion. We're praying for you. So then let us lift up our hearts together to God in prayer. Holy One, Holy Three, you lavish upon us abundant goodness. In the empty cross we do find our joy, our hope, our life. We see grace unending as you have loved us, even when we have been so hurt and needed you. We also feel your suffering there as you suffer with us in a broken world. We pray for everyone today suffering, for mothers who must separate from their children. We pray for families who are separated by illness or circumstance. We pray for families in places around the world that are divided from peace, divided by conflict, divided by poverty, divided by injustice. God, we ask that we would know and feel your healing in the world, that we would know and feel your peace. And we are bold to pray for ourselves this day for all of the cries that are in our hearts that we cannot speak aloud. We leave these at the foot of the cross now. O oh Lord, if today does not bring what we want, if this week does not bring an answer to our prayers that we expected, we ask that you would increase our faith so that our doubt and impatience would decrease and that we would show steadfastness in walking with you each and every day. Hear us as we pray together the prayer that your son Jesus Christ taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. It is from a place of privilege that we are able to give back at all. And we are all asked to give back from the abundance which God has given us to give back of our time and talents and treasure. You'll find in this week's bulletin and announcements, both of which are available online and should have been emailed to you, you'll find um, a list of our prayer concerns as well as ongoing mission opportunities, ways that you can serve, as well as financial information. Please join us as we together try and meet those needs that we see in the community, you may follow the link in this QR code, you may send in a check, you may call the church office, and we would be glad to connect you um, with all of the ministries at St. Giles. So now let us give as we have been given. Please join in our closing beautiful hymn of dedication and stewardship. Take my life, hymn 697. Take my life. 
As we reach the end of our service, what does the Lord require of us? To seek justice, love kindness, and walk humbly with our God. God is good all the time, and all the time, God is good. Sisters and brothers, the beauty of the cross is it is a place of judgment and a place of mercy. The beauty of the cross is its paradox and mystery. I was told in seminary, always preach the gospel. I hope today, even though we speak difficult truth and encourage you to have struggles in faith as you wrestle with realities, you also find an abundance in God's mercy and a never-ending source of God's love. Your challenge, your charge this week is to go out and confront a truth that you have kept at bay that will be something to wrestle with, something that may cause you to sacrifice, and something that will help you to grow. Let that be a holy listening as you partner with the Spirit in growth. 
and go into the world surrounded by God's love, redeemed by Christ on the cross, and sharing the life and love and justice and mercy of God through the Spirit with every breath you take and every action you partake in. This day and evermore, walk in truth and love. Amen.